Um, and that elephant seal probably weighs about 6,000 pounds. And, and it's probably about 17 feet long. So if that man is average height, just under six feet, weighs 180 pounds, that seal weighs 30 times as much as he does and is three times as long as he is tall. So that in itself is pretty cool. Being big is pretty cool. The other cool thing is they got a really big nose. So I like big noses. And I want you to note this transverse process that's up here at the top here. Um, and what that enables them to do is take the nose and to bring the nose down. And so if you're talking about length, I like this picture by Phil Green. Uh, because you can see it, the nose is about as long as a pup right there. And if you look at the nose themselves, hear that? that's not my dinner. That's the elephant seal taking the nose and putting it into his mouth and using the mouth as a resonance structure. So as he blows air into the mouth, it comes back up. Also shown in southern elephant seals, but, and not, not yet or northern elephant seals, but probably the same. But the size of that nose allows increased resonance, right? They're blowing more air that's going in there and coming out and also increases the size of the guy's harem and is independent of the size of the seal, right? So sometimes size matters. <laughs> um, the other cool thing about these guys that I, I, I really like is that they're, they're amazing divers. They can dive almost a mile deep. Now remember that story about the time depth recorder a little bit earlier. It goes down and measures pressure. First time they put one of these on an elephant seal, elephant seal came back, they went back out, they captured it, and it was crushed. <laughs> like a piece of paper crumbled up. And they said, well, I must have rubbed it on. And one of the scientists said, maybe they're diving deeper than we think they are. Because most animals are not diving that deep. So they put a reinforced model on, and they went and looked at it. And they found that, you know what, these guys, not all the time, most of their dives may be around 1,000 to 1,500 feet, but they are making dives down to 5,100 feet. And that is phenomenal because we used to think that the sperm whale on the left um, at just under 4,000 feet was one of the deepest divers. And then we've learned that we have uh, some beak whales that can actually go over. Um, but they actually don't get out on land and spend months out on land either. So I give that to the elephant seal, still my favorite. And they, an, a male elephant seal will be on the beach. They'll have a harem. They'll breed. After they breed, they'll go all the way up to Alaska. And then they'll feed up there. And then they'll go all the way back down to that beach where they lived before. And then that's when we see them a lot of times because they're going to molt. And they'll come into the San Juans and they'll molt in the San Juans. They'll be on the beach for a while and then they'll go back out to sea. So if I did this little equation. If they're out at sea at 150 days and I looked at some of the, the graphs, they're actually diving or ascending 15 hours a day if we took that into a 24 hour period. At six hours, they're at depth. So 1,500 feet to 5,000 feet. And it's only three hours every 24 hour period that they're actually at the surface. That's amazing for an animal that can get out and walk around on the land, right? So let's move a little bit to another charismatic uh, megavertebrate. So we like to take pictures of this uh, 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 southern resident killer whale. We like to take pictures of these guys at the surface because, well, that's where we are, right? And that's where we see them. But really, you have to remember that like the, like the elephant seal, their life is really about being underwater. And even more so, their life is about the ears. So um, hit that button there. So this is a call. One of the most um, common southern resident killer whale calls that was given to me by the Whale Museum. And this is also a ringtone, thanks to Joe T. Um, so you can go on your website. And I've never used this one before, so you guys have to report back what people say when this thing goes off and you're in the grocery store. Um, but the interesting thing is they also make clicks. And these are sounds that are used for communication. The clicks are actually used for echolocation. So we've all heard about echolocation and bats and, and, and cetaceans and things like that. And I try, I'll try and give you an explanation of how it works because it's not pr really straightforward. But these guys have in their blowhole, right, because their, their nose is elongated, their nostrils come up here. And at the top of that blowhole, they have some little out pouches called phonic lips. So they can blow air in there, and then they can push the air back and forth from side to side or front without expelling the air. And then they can create sound as that air gets pushed over top of these structures, right? Then they got this real fat pad, this melon that sits right in front of those phonic lips. Sound gets directed through the melon, and the melon directs the sound. So whatever they're pointing at, that's where the sound is going. The sound goes about, sound hits something, the sound comes back. Now, they're not walking around like I do with big ears, right? What happens is that sound comes back and hits them right in the jaw. And their jaws are very, very thin. A little bit thicker on the transients because they're eating marine mammals, but very, very thin on all of the cetaceans because they're not chewing, they're not masticating. Inside of that jaw, that very thin jawbone, is a fat pad. And that fat pad goes back to the jaw and sits right at the tympanic bulla, right at the ear. And so that noise is transmitted out through the fat, back through the fat, targeted right at the base of the ear, and then hits the incus uh, stapes and malleus and makes the noise, and then they hear what's going on. So that's kind of 
okay, whatever, Joe. But then I, I learned about this really cool kid called Ben Underwood. And ben was uh, blinded when he was a young kid because he had cancer in both of his eyes. So they removed both of his eyes when he was a young kid. And he learned how to echolocate, even though he didn't have all these fancy structures. So I'm going to show you a little video, and then I want to apologize ahead of time because the cancer did come back as a teenager and Ben did die. But this is a fantastic um, image of how this sound really works and how this kid has really mastered it. So let's take a look at that real quick. Ben says he can distinguish where the cars are as he cruises his neighborhood streets. Listen to him clicking. He can't see the basket he's aiming for. By listening for the distinctive echoes each makes, he can find the pole and backboard on a basketball goal and sink a basket. Taking a walk with Ben, I was amazed at what he can see with his ears. Well, there's a fire hydrant on the side and a car on this side. Wait, is that, no, that's a trash can. Or, <laughs> man, hold on, let me see. Watch, watch his foot. Watch how he just, he hits it. That's a trash can. <laughs> yeah, that's a trash can. Or a recycling An amazing, amazing kid. And so now I want you to think about Ben Underwood, Stevie Wonder, and all of these people that live in the world of the killer whale. And I want you to watch this video from Debbie Giles. Okay, this is one whale. This is September 22nd, last fall. This is K33. See the 33 moving. And that's the yellow. And all of the red are what? Boats. Okay, so these are boats, and this is the whale moving. Now, remember what this whale is doing when it's moving around, in addition to communicating with his friends, gee, a lot of boats around today, he's also <laughs> trying to find some salmon, right? He's trying to say, okay, I'm picking some salmon up over there. And so if you think about the noise and how important that noise is, it kind of gives you a little bit of an impression about why people are concerned about boat traffic around southern resident killer whales. Because if you have a limited prey base that's already there, and then you have increased ambient noise, such as in the situation shown in this situation, then uh, you're going to decrease the amount of area that um, you can find your prey. And so this is why uh, the NOAA fishery said, hey, we want to increase some distance around the whales. And whales will come up to your boat. And whales like to be next to your boat. But the issue is they can be next to your boat when they want to be next to your boat. And giving them that distance helps them to be able to find some food. So I think it's some cool things about science that help us understand not just how cool animals are, but actually how, what we can do to make sure that they're there and persist over time. Let's talk about a couple other mammals. This is a, a great picture by Phil Green. And there's, there are a lot of mammals out of that 37 that we don't necessarily think of as marine mammals. So this is a river otter. River otter, right? Fresh water. But all over this place, they're most common otter that we see. We don't see sea otters. And they've really mastered the ability to go into the marine waters and use the prey base that's available. But they are limited. They have to go back and drink fresh water as they go along. We go to another one. So you guys are pretty pretty familiar with this Pisasterocratius, the sea stars as predators of barnacles in the area. And if you've ever taken a marine biology course, you know that predators, just like where the water moves, lets us know where certain animals like barnacles are going to live or barnacles are not going to live. But we never really think of this. Um, so we never really think of a bear as a predator of a barnacle. But they are, and they are in the Salish Sea, and they probably used to be all over this area, but because of human habitation, we've actually pushed them out into the northern reaches. So you have to go up to Campbell River or, 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 or um, Butte Inlet or different areas like that if you want to see these guys. So we also have to remember that animals that are still part of the Salish Sea, we don't consider them part of the Salish Sea because we don't see them, but they actually are inter integral um, predators. And I've uh, been up there, and I've seen them not just eating barnacles, but mussels and crabs and all kinds of cool things like that. This is another thing, uh, this is, I have to admit, this is up in Alaska, but I thought it was so cool on the bears and barnacles. So this is a paper that was published re recently by a guy named Volker Deek, and he was up in Alaska doing some work. And this is a grizzly bear, and what you see in the top two pictures, he's gone down and he's picked up a rock with barnacles on it. He checked out the rock, didn't like the rock, threw it back in, picked up another rock, and then spent a minute grooming his beard with the rock. <laughs> Remember, no thumbs, right? Holding it in there. Threw the rock down, did some foraging, found another rock, and then went up and cleaned himself off as he's going around like this. So this is, it's only one animal. It's not all the grizzly bears that are doing it. But I think it's another cool bears to barnacle type of a story, so I just had to throw that in there. Okay, so fortuitous finding. But there's also a lot of other things. Black-tailed deer, love them, hate them, eat them, whatever. <laughs> they, are, they are grazers in the intertidal area, and this probably in the fucus. Um, and, and this one, Pete, I don't know what this guy was doing. 
late for the ferry or something like that. <laughs> Not much there for Hinnom and Grays. Let's move on to the birds. So I said 172 different bird species in the, in the Salish Sea. And this is one of the smallest ones, 25 gram little brown job. There's a, some, so this is actually a western sandpiper, and they're pretty cool. It's not just about the species we have, go to the next one, Joe, it's about the places that we have. So the Fraser River Delta is probably um, the one site where all of the world's western sandpipers migrate through. They make a 12,000 mile migration from Alaska, and some of them go all the way down to Peru. The Fraser River Delta is, the, is one of the major stopping off points. But there's actually lots of stopping off points, and Sea Doc funded a project a few years ago trying to look at a certain technique called uh, plasma metabolites to determine how, how fat do they get at these sites so we can pick out sites not just like the Fraser River uh, site, which is already a reserve, but other sites. So we'll go to the next one. So this is not a bird, but this is a bad animal. So this is a honey badger. Go to the next one. And, and, and 30 pounds, but they've been known to, to fight lions and stuff off of kill. So I like these guys. I like mustelids just in general. But the reason I brought them up is I, this is the bird up in the top, right? So this is the, the, um, the honey creeper. And this is a bird that's established a relationship with honey badgers. And it'll go to honey badgers or even to people. And it will start chirping and it will take them to the honeycomb. And then the honey, the honey badger will go. And of course, the honey badger... You know, they got thick fur, they don't mess around with anything. They're just gonna dive in and open up and then they'll share. And the bird actually likes to eat the wax in the honeycomb. And the badger likes to eat the larvae and, 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 the, um, and the honey out of there. So it's kind of a mutualistic relationship. They don't need each other, but it's just a relationship that's been developed over, over a long time. And so I kind of draw uh, an analogy to a little relationship that we have um, in the Salish Sea area. Everybody knows that this guy, um, uh, eagle, and then this is a common myrrh. So common myrrhs are kind of like the northern variety of penguins. So they dive into the water, they use their wings to fly, um, they can dive qu quite deep, hundreds and hundreds of feet to eat schooling forage fish, um, and they are communal nesters. So they nest at sites where all of them will nest, and they'll raise one to two young. They have a cool egg, it's a little bit oblong, and you look at it and you think, well, that's an imperfect egg, but actually it's perfect because if you're nesting on a shelf and the egg rolls, it'll just roll around a little circle. 